And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one, two, three good brothers. Ha 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 ha! We have the, ma the man of a thousand contracts, the handsome devil of the Geek Watch, good brother JT. We have the man guiding you through all through all of your anime and the and the gavel wielder of the parliament. Good brother Shades. And we have the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. Straight to the point this time. Well, we are <laughs> we are um one week late and gay. We have we ended up going seven days into the Doku challenge. <laughs> also, I have to make a minor correction. I am the form I formally was the take when taking over your anime? I no longer can hold that title. I didn't say that. I said you, you the said, I, well, I said guiding you through VTubers. You said anime. You did you say anime. anime. Okay, my anime. okay, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Play play me off with the fail horn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold on, guys, guys, guys. I got this. Hey. Yeah, this is what... Now, we had planned on doing this last week, but um, a little thing called Revolution happened and was much longer and, mu and much more of an investiture than I had initially planned. <laughs> no, Monk, it's an AEW pay-per-view. You should have known this shit was going to get crazy. Well, at the, at the very least, we did. At the very least, we didn't have snakes and sparklers as the end. Don't re fucking remind me. I will <laughs> keep reminding people so that people fucking learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remind them. Don't need to remind me. <laughs> that but they be, view us. That be given the, and given that I'm probably gonna have to put this in advance. If there is a Sunday that has a AEW pay per view, which is only going to be four times out of the year. Um, don't expect a recording of Geek Watch because I know I'm going to be watching and I'm going to be exhausted. And <laughs> while there's times where we, grant, granted, there was the time that we jumped right in after after um after All Out that one year. That was a special case because what we were going to be talking about was wrestling related. That was the um 20 years of minus five stars. Not yeah. And. But the, at the big reason for that is I I know that those are going to go long because because it's going to be going through both the buy-in which I did watch after the fact and the and the actual show and since, since it's an AEW show um I know I'm gonna I know I'm gonna be on autopilot afterwards. <laughs> it's not to, not to besmirch the show. It's just there's a when you when you have a shit ton of good matches. One's energy can only stretch so far. Yeah, and uh, they don't really have... They didn't really have room for a cooldown match during this last one. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, we're here now. Yeah. So... To, so, um... For this week, we, were, we are returning to the wild and wacky world of video games after neglecting it for a few weeks. And... I would and I would le I would like to op open up with a bit open up with a bit of a song <clears throat> somewhere beyond the sea, beyond the sea. somewhere, somewhere waiting, waiting for me, me. <laughs> <laughs> ah. and on golden sands <laughs> and watches the ship that oh, that's, actually... that's actually pretty good, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So, as if it wasn't obvious enough, this week is Bioshock: The Infinite Rapture. Ah, it's been a long time since I've had a chance to talk about this series. So, seems a bit late in coming. Yeah. We had other more important things to address. Mm. Oh yes, very important things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed. Um, namely, namely, la namely, laughing at Games Workshop being embarrassed by 3D printing yet again. 
Commissar Gamza made a buttermilk bob great and clean one uh, 3D print model. I saw that. <laughs> for those for those who aren't aware, Commissar Gamza has made a, has made a sport out of mocking Games Workshop apologists with the nickname Buttermilk Bob. They're the people who love Ultramarines to the death and uh, think that Games Workshop can do no wrong. Even when they and they sound the like, <laughs> yeah, <Good. laughs> and and they sound like an overweight, obese Kermit the Frog. You son of a bitch! <laughs> and Kermit the Bullfrog, oh, I... <laughs> and they they, it's a lot a lot of what Gamza does that pi that pisses them off is bringing up how you how you can get the same quality of mi of minis with a three D printer. That um, Games Workshop is charging ridiculous amounts for, with a budget mm -hmm. 3D printer, ones that's only like 300 bucks plus a little bit of resin. Which, yeah, 300 bucks is a bit much, but that's not far removed from what you'd pay for a uh, con for a gaming console these days. Not far, not far removed from what you pay for a Kill Team package these days. <laughs> a fucking package with like what, fuck, with like what, ten minis. <laughs> Ten minis, and it's two hundred seventy-five dollars. I can get I can get several armies worth in in other games with that kind of money. Exactly, rails though. Yeah. Yes, rails, get, rails. Getting please. back on the rails. Um, <sighs> I I like opening with the even though I like opening with the humble origins of things. It is a little bit difficult for me to not address a certain elephant in the room. So before we even can get to Bioshock, we need to talk about its predecessor, Looking Glass Studios. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, excellent. Looking Glass Studios wa was um was in a is known for being in a 3D arms race with id back in the day and in f and in fact the infamous thing where um John Carmack, the the um, galaxy brain meme incarnate that he is, <laughs> um, looked at Ultima Underworld, which was a pioneer when it came to immersive sims, and said that he and said that he could make a faster tech a faster texture mapper than th than they did. Which what which, if that sounds arrogant, well it probably is. Except well he did. <laughs> He backed up his com he backed up his arrogance with actions mm. and Let uh <laughs> basically led the industry for almost a decade. The game that came out of that was Wolfenstein 3D, which technically speaking could be considered one of the most successful remakes of all time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you know um, the story, yeah. Yeah. And and <laughs> as as we just pointed out, Carmack actually had the skills to back shit up. Mm -hmm. Um which let's it doesn't leave many stat points left for socialization let's just leave it at that yeah yeah which we'll, makes it ironic that he ended up getting working with facebook to help create the oculus <laughs> oh, i'm not getting into that well no, neither am i we'll probably, we'll AR, probably end up doing it. go ahead ar crimes against the face <laughs> we will probably end up Delving, delving into it a bit more clo a bit more closely another day, but the concept of immersive sim can basically be summed up as taking the first person perspective, but not necessarily doing a first person shooter. Um, all the patient zero for a lot of this is Ultima Underworld, and Ultima Underworld, while it was a groundbreaker, I'd he I'd hesitate to recommend people playing it because of how unintuitive the design was. Because As someone it was who's played, sorry, <laughs> it was trying. It was trying to have. It was trying to have the same level of detail that an adventure game does. Yeah, I've played the original Ultima Underworld. Uh, one, it's slow as shit. Like compared to what you're used to, it is a slow ass FPS. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, good luck mapping anything on that fucking thing. <laughs> Like it has a map system, but uh, oh boy! And because it go it based its item its inventory system on the Ultima games, 
Good, yeah, trying to sort through that shit is a fucking nightmare. It is a first-person adventure, long before Metroid Prime made it a thing. Mm. <laughs> and and uh, it feels like it. It was, um... That's, what, that's why it's interesting comparing that to Wolfenstein 3D, because while there was a whole lot more you could do with Ultima Underworld, Wolfenstein 3D had a far lower barrier to entry. It also had one of the most... Um... One of the most, I think, probably one of the most remembered uh, command line interface cheats to launch it with ever. Goober. Yeah. Well, let's, al let's also not forget the um, contest that that wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for for all of those out there scratching your head, going Ultima Hoozy, what's it now? It's before your time. Thank We're you, old and folks. also thank you for reminding all of us here how old we are. <laughs> I We're not old. We're seasoned. I mean, I uh, I just I don't know about you. I just turned thirty-seven myself. I know I know I'm not the oldest here, but my God, <laughs> thirty-seven. He's gone through thirty-seven years in a row. In a row. <laughs> God damn! You didn't make the joke earlier today. Fuck you. <laughs> no thanks. Fuck you're you. not my type. <laughs> <laughs> I, anyway. I don't think I don't think Lady K would let would let him get away with it anyway. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Anyway. Yeah. But. but um, now, of, co of course, there's been other things. I do, I do really want to discuss Thief one of these days. Um, all, th all three games. Yes, I said three. The fourth one doesn't exist, and fuck anybody who says it does. We don't talk about that there anymore. What are we talking about now? Who are but, the people? But if, but the th but the other entry that ne that needs to be discuss that needs to be discussed is System Shock. Now, first, while the enhanced edition certainly makes playing System Shock better. Vanilla System Shock was a UI nightmare. Like a I UI would've... nightmare, sort of. Yeah. And lo and it, a lot of people dismissed it as a Doom clone, which it really wasn't, which... And... Of course, the, of, but... Um, in the interim after that, some of, some of the people at Looking Glass left... Left and formed irrational games, including one Ken Levine. And even though even though there was this departure, they were still willing to work on the successor, System Shock 2, which incidentally was using the Thief engine, which is why you have enemies wielding shotguns in a, in that weird way. Um, <laughs> yeah, but let's be honest, but it ended up working out because System Shock 2, compared to its predecessor, was actually a pretty massive success. Mm-hmm. I, first I, time. Although what although what I do find kind of amusing is that it's it's trying to have a RPG like system, but you know how um you know how there were balancing problems when it came to skill allocation in Deus Ex. System Shock Two is worse as in well. that regard. Oh yeah, oh uh, yeah. Like it, it's funny at the beginning of System Shock Two, it asks you to pick a class. Pick whatever the fuck you want, because before long, you're going to be able to max out all... You, you can easily max out your skills in every department and just do whatever the fuck you want. Well, here's here's the weird thing about that. And I do... I, um... If I ever get a chance to meet anybody who, wor anybody who worked on System Shock 2, I'd want to ask them if somebody was playing Traveler in the office. Because the way that that thing is set up of trying to give you a backstory before the story starts... Very much feels like the life path system you'd see in Traveler, just without the whole "you may die before" during character creation thing. But the but the weird the weird thing about about the skill system is how is how levels are is how levels is importance is allocated. Because it se it seems to be usually it's supposed to be a rising escalation of usefulness. In a lot of the skills with System Shock 2, it's it rises a bit and then it goes down like a like a mountain. <laughs> having skills is is having a variety of skills is important, but maxing those skills out not so much. You want the accessibility rather than the ease. And it do, it does feel at times like it's like it's meant like you're uh, meant to play a certain way, that being a combat hacker and Lord help anybody who decides who decides to play as a psychic on their first build. Oh <laughs> Lord, yeah. 
Have fun with that. Oh. Uh, have fun have fun with being have fun with being the guys that the D and D nerds shove into a locker. And that's saying something. They all wear pocket protectors and spectacles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but and system system shock the only but the only real problem with System Shock Two was um, the the age old case of foreshadowing a twist. Yeah, you can pretty much figure out what the twist is going to be pretty quickly, especially if you played the original. Now, Mandalore had, in his review of System Shock Two did did um did commission an artist to do some alternative artwork, one that one that depicted Xerxes at. Um, as well as well as the many, which I think would have I think would have done done for a better cover art than having Shodan on the cover. Yeah, literally giving away the plot twist there. Mm -hmm. Especially since um, the the weird thing is when people when people um associate Shodan, they're they're applying the System Shock two appearance to how she acted in the first game, except. In two, she's. It's very clear that she was put in at the last minute, and the because because um in the first in the first System Shock game and incidentally this is something I'd like to see a, a Metroidvania do but ha but hasn't yet. You are a rat in a maze, and Sis and Shodan is the scientist watching over the maze. And e even when you think you get some sort of advantage, it ends. Up, it can. It's likely a trap, and she has some sort of backup plan, or sends so or sends monsters after you. For all of you younger people, think Gladys, but actually competent. I'd bet. I'd say the better way to put it is think Gladys, except she's actually trying to kill you. Okay. Yeah. Gladys, but she's actually so. Wheatley with Gladys's competence. There we go. The part where he tries to kill you would actually be the part where he does kill you. Yeah. But in System Shock Two, she was a, a glorified quest giver, and the whole the whole you're an insect thing got repetitive real quick. And then we get into the whole um, melding space with cyberspace because of because of the FTL drive, which which um. Didn't qu didn't quite stick the landing. Oh, however, in the in the aftermath of that, there were plans for a th for a third system shock, which ultimately did ultimately didn't so didn't come around. Especially since Looking Glass was on its last legs at that point, before a lot of the people would merge over into Ion Storm, for better and for worse. Yeah, though, uh, looking online, it looks like Irrational Games was already a company, so the, a lot of them also probably merged, uh, jumped on board there, too. Yeah, there was, there was kind of a co-development with Irrational and Looking Glass with System Shock 2. I, I like to think of it as Looking Glass already had one foot out of the door. Yeah. But it, at, the very least, the, at the very least, there were no hard feelings. It's, ju it's just... Bad shit happens sometimes, but I will admit I would have I would pay good money to see what the design document for the System Shock Three that we never got would have been, just to see what just to see what parts may have may have been, may have been prototypes of what we inevitably got, because then we ended up getting Bioshock, which decided to go decided to go a much much different route. It went a much different transhumanist route, but it's still transhumanist nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi. And I think not the, not just the transhumanist nature, but also going with a Art Deco aesthetic, which I don't think many games were doing Art de Art Deco aesthetic then and even now. I'd say I'd say the biggest example of a game in the last few years that's done Art Deco is Skullgirls. Skullgirls, yeah. And then the last Art Deco game I could think of before... Actually, it would even be before Bioshock would be uh, the um, Starship Titanic uh, whodunit game. It was a point-and-click adventure on the PC, and it was basically solve the Titanic before the Titanic happens. In space! In space! Everything's in space! 
How do you do that? Clean throat. But when it but when it came to what I do find kind of amusing is that a lot of a lot of the motifs are st are still there. Um, I look at I look at Bioshock as learning from lessons from the first two games. But I mean, you do you even though it's even though it's not as blatant, you do still have those moments of a ra of a rat in a maze. But you also have some of the horror elements that we saw in two. Mm -hmm. Um, now, within the, within the, within the set, I think the other thing that certainly, that certainly helped Bioshock stand out is the, is the emphasis on its particular themes. And, and this is where I want, this is where I want to get into the, na the, the man who, the man for whom all of, the, all of this turns, Andrew Ryan. Hmm. I have Hi. I have seen some debate about whether or not Andrew Ryan is an Ayn Rand style obje objectivist or not. If you want, if we want to get act get really pedantic about it, he is not a Ayn Rand style objectivist. That's mainly be that's mainly because his I look at his philosophy as trying to be a fusion between Ayn Rand's philosophy. And that and that of Nietzsche. Yeah, I can kind of see that. Like, it's very clear there's some inspiration from Rand, but I don't think that's all there is to it. Obviously, mm -hmm. if anything, it, it's a it's a straw man or caricature of Randian uh, objectivism. Hmm. And what? And I'd say I'd say a lot of it is co is colored by hit by his earlier um his er his earlier de his earlier encounters with with um go with governments because it's the way that I've seen it is that he his hatred for uh, for the concept of altruism is more is more on a group level than on a personal level a person being altruistic I don't think he has a problem with. But he seems to have a particular hate for the idea of a greater good. Yeah. Well, yes, because such such ideals commonly get used as bludgeons, cudgels, or manipulation to make people do things they wouldn't normally do and justify them. Mm -hmm. The yeah. sweet also irony is he he starts fostering this belief in a great chain. Well, and but he also says that it's a chain he wants to break. Also, if we're going to talk about the greater good, I kind of had to hit this button. The greater, the greater good. good. Shut that tap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, the 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 idea of the great chain, um. is more voluntary than the greater good um which is where where some of uh ryan's ideals fall into individualism he doesn't want to see people forced into situations where they're doing things because it's what the group is doing yeah, and I'm actually looking on the Bioshock wiki right now. There actually is a reasoning behind his m mentality for all this. This was a guy who grew up during the Russian Revolution. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that the 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 the, the corruption that caught that caught that the Rush the communist Russia did during the or the Soviet communism did that would kind of color his look outlook on doing things for the sake of for the sake of the state and the state of everyone else when it destroyed his family's business and led to the death of many of his own family. Mm -hmm. That's that's why he that's why he compares the farmer and the and his food and the sweat of his of his brow to uh both the US government and the Soviet government and uh and their pr their uh primary um ideologies I guess would be the best way to put it and says no it should all go to you you should be the one to ultimately uh 
decide and distribute the the efforts of your own labor. Yeah. Um, if you want to be helpful to others, then go ahead. But if but it should not be mandatory. It should not be forced. It should be your choice. You put in the work. You decide what happens to the benefits. Which is Andrew, why he, Andrew Ryan strikes me as a guy who doesn't like tipping. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's um, not, let's not forget the fact that when when the U.S. government had to, had to, had told him to turn a a garden that he made, what well, I think it was either a forest or a garden that he made into a into a um into a state owned park, he burned the fucking thing down. Yes. Um. The the this is why he why a lot of people um compare him to objectivism because a lot of what he does is very close to objectivist philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm going to butcher this because I don't want to look at the direct quote. Uh, so this is a paraphrase of a part from Rand's novels where one character asks another about altruism and whether altruism um, is forbidden in the type of society they're looking for. And they're like, it basically boils down to, well, no, it wouldn't be, but there would also, in my type of society, no one would see the point. There'd be no reason for altruism to them. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the, the, I, the, and I can see why they would think that. Because if you, if everyone is pulling their weight and doing their part, you wouldn't need to be altruistic because everyone would be able to take care of themselves. Of course, it it assumes a perfect world where nobody ever gets sick or injured or sudden deaths or anything like that. But we won't get into how uh, unrealistic objectivism is in this Geek Watch, or probably yeah. ever. We don't tend to cover political powder kegs that fucking stupid. No. But what? But um. These the. But I. Th but he. I'd say what I'd say one of the early one of the early cracks that he um that he that he actually I take this back there are two major cracks in the idea of ra of rapture that um that festered because he didn't be because he didn't keep too close of an eye on it one of them is um put is putting far too much emphasis on the on the more sk on the more skilled fields and not not cons not taking into consideration how he'd accommodate um more unskilled forms of labor the of the other thing the other thing um, I don't think he took into he took into account is the fa is the fact that want wanting pe wanting people who had a certain drive could bring could bring in people who were not exactly a full picnic, as it were. It would also bring in people who weren't exactly uh, pro-social. That type of ambition can just as easily lead to criminal mindsets as it can to someone who would try to revitalize and revolutionize their own fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there there will be people who are who drive to make the make their lives better and even help others, but there are also people who have just as much drive to fuck people over and to just take everything for themselves. And that's some that's something that he that he didn't that he didn't quite grasp. And I'd I'd say um there's a couple of major examples of things that if he had a better sense of self-policing Instead, instead of just letting everyone in that hap that happened to have the same morals that he did, and this is a, this is something you see with certain political groups, but rails is Sa is Sander Cohen and Frank Fontaine. Uh, Cohen and Fontaine. Cohen, Cohen, Cohen especially regard, regarding his regarding his particular insanities, and granted the the discovery of of the sea slugs that produce atoms certainly didn't help matters. The discovery of sea slugs that create a, a, a material that can allow you to s splice and recombine the genetic 
uh, the the entire human genome without issue? Well, without issue, at least it seemed. Mm -hmm. We've yeah. seen what happens to splicers. It oh, is we've seen what happens to splicers. Excessive at the use of atom in small doses is is of course harmless. In large doses, um, it ends up it ends up acting more like a cancer. One that it, one that causes all manner of degradation. It causes you to go fucking batshit. Mm -hmm. And I'd say I'd say that um, not not that the thing the thing about the thing about ambition is that sometimes sometimes one's ambition can go, can go can, is not exactly one that plays well with others. Which I'd say is exactly what happened when it came, when it came to having somebody like Fontaine on who had his own ambition of turning the entire city of Rapture into into the biggest racket of all time. Yeah, Fontaine Fontaine was a Fontaine was very clearly old family. His name even kind of clues you into that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and he thought, there's a bunch of suckers here, and I can swindle them out of everything. Which, he wasn't far off. The, um, the problem with Rapture as a society is it wasn't a society. It was a loose coalition, or even just a collection, of individuals all doing their own thing because they could now. There was nothing holding them back. It's the idea that it's the idea of um, a utopian ideal uh, is impossible is not possible uh, when in the face of human free will uh, when it's unfettered. Mm -hmm. Well. The the issue was there was nothing encouraging social association between all levels of strata in in Rapture. Rapture still had the haves and have nots that um, that Ryan even warned about. You know, there's still going to be people who are disenfranchised and aren't able to have the same benefits that others do simply because they're not brilliant. But they do have, you know, the, the will to work and survive in a place like that, which is its own will that's very, very laudable in many cases. But uh, you want to know another irony? Hmm. He didn't learn. He didn't learn the lessons of prohibition. Also true. <laughs> he didn't learn the lessons of, of, of the of what happened with the speakeasies in nineteen twenty in the nineteen twenties because nineteen tens. The idea, the idea of tr of trying to ban of trying to ban alcohol, which, <laughs> um, good good luck good luck doing that when you ha when you ha when when you have a whole lot of um a whole lot of alcohol in, in as a as a part of culture, especially since there were special exceptions for religions shortly after prohibition started. It pretty it pretty much gave and pretty much gave and it didn't stop people from drinking. It just stopped people from drinking legally. And publicly. It mm -hmm. hit it away. Yeah. Which co which caused which caused the rapid rise of boot of bootleggers and sm and smugglers because people wanted their alcohol. Yep. The same thing happened in Rapture when he banned well anything having to do with he Adam. And... He didn't ban it, but he extremely regulated it where he, where um if he didn't approve of Certain surface material, certain surface stuff, coming into Rapture, it wouldn't come in, which yeah. just opens a wide door for a contraband market. Yeah, yeah. But which, of course, Fontaine, being again, like I said, from old families, mm -hmm. um, immediately saw I can. <laughs> he's just made my racket easier. Essentially, I'd, I'd say some. I'd say something else that didn't. That is a. A um per, a case in point, when it comes to the flaws of of his philosophy, is the grocery store story. Mm -hmm. You had two. 
I don't recall if this was in... I, this was hinted at in one of the audio logs, which, incidentally, is one of those things that... I, audio logs in games is one of those things I like, but I think some people abuse. I'll get into that in a minute. But there were two compete. There were two um, grocery stores in the same area. Um, one of them was owned by a person who not only owned the set his grocery store, but also owned the um, owned the gar- owned the garbage management, and was char- and was charging his competitor a ridiculous amount. One because he could because he could, and two as a mean as a means to run him out of business. And when this was brought up to Ryan, to Ryan, his response was a un, a unfettered open market is part of Rapture. So I would advise you to come up with a better product. So this is this is not at this point. That's a that is a difference between an unfettered open market and what is meant by Adam Smith's free market. But we won't get into that. That's a Entirely different video. Um, Uh There are market forces and market uh, issues that can that are taken care of in a good free market in separate ways. But yes, Ryan was not the best at navigating the whole situation of one of your people is actively harming another, Um, which is again against. Another part of why people compare him to an, to objectivism, um, which is actually a, a a what I consider a poor way of comparing to an objectivist because of the fact that uh, objectivism doesn't seek to cause harm. They don't really see a point. If you're doing if you're doing what you do with your thing. You don't care about what other people are doing with theirs, mm-hmm. and so uh, it's just it, it, the the comparisons to project, objectivism still fall short there. But Ryan was just of the of the opinion that everything should be as open as possible, and nobody should care about what happens. And that's that's not. Uh, that's not how how any of that works. No. <laughs> and the f- the fact that that he that he had that he had um he that he was not that he did not look at this because he was so he was far he was far too dependent on maintaining on maintaining the idea of his ideals that he, that he didn't see what was right in front of him, and that's why, even when even when the heat got too much on Fontaine, he was just able to um, retool himself as Atlas, and be, and basically be basically play this role of voice of the people, the Vox Populi. Yes. Yeah. Um, of course, Atlas, uh, Atlas slash Fontaine, um, also did a dirty like a real dirty in the end with jack yeah yeah which he even even going as far as to call him call him solely his ace in the hole yeah yeah which um you know how we you know how we talked about how the showdown reveal in system shock 2 is is it was a bad twist because it was telegraphed pretty early on, and not just with the cover, but with the fact that the many refer keep asking if you're associated with the machine mother. Well, I think this is as good of time as any to talk about it. To talk about the fact that with Bioshock we have a twist that actually works, and it manages to work in what for one reason. You have a, you have a fr- you have a phrase that is that seems very innocuous, especially when it's done with that particular accent. That you don't you you don't realize its a, its effect until 
until the until the rug is actually pulled from under you with with the understanding of the phrase would you kindly would you kindly go pick up a wrench now and do something about that yeah when you first hear him ask ask it that way when you hear him say those words you don't think anything of it i mean but his accent you're like oh okay that's just his dialect it's like okay that's cool and he and when he keeps doing it you don't think anything of it but then once you once you get near the end and it's revealed that that whole phrase actually has a purpose you look back at everything that happened prior to that and you're like son of a bitch motherfucker has been playing me this whole time mm -hmm. well and i think what was particularly um <sighs> poignant about it um was it's tied to the gameplay and no one realizes it until the reveal yeah because anytime atlas says would you kindly go do x you get golden auras around the next thing you do and you're just like oh it's it's just my guidance mechanic it tells me what i can interact with and what needs to be interacted with mm -hmm. no motherfucker uh what's happening is would you kindly uh, as a sublimit a subliminary trigger for a what is essentially a sleeper agent um compels you to do a thing now you could say that's an interesting way to tie narrative and mechanics together and it is it's a great way to tie it all together and say there was never any other way to do this because there was never any other thing you could do you were compelled to do it the entire time um of course you know third ha third act of the game that isn't quite the case but we'll get to that um but then the second most poignant example of that is the face-to-face -face confrontation with ryan mm-hmm His question of what is the difference between a man and a slave. Yeah. A slave and, obeys. And, and and again, you're thinking, oh, well, you're you're just pissed off because I'm do I, I've been following the Atlas because he's been guiding me to this point, not realizing no, he's literally saying you are a slave because you've been doing his bidding, unknown unbeknownst to you that it's actually obligatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do. Would you kindly is a request. It sounds like a request, and it sounds think, like a reasonable one usually. Yeah, up until that point, and I think even at, I think at the end, I think even Ryan uses that to kind of force your hand. Um, well, the thing about that is, uh, you have the you know he he you know it sounds like he's asking for you to finish him off with the golf club, finish him off with the golf club. And the button, and it gives you a button prompt that says, basically, kill him with a golf club. However, you don't, you, you can choose not to, you choose not to hit him with a golf club, i.e. the idea, the, uh, the idea that you have choice to spare him. But here's the thing, you can't leave the room, nothing else will happen, and the game will not proceed unless you finish him off. So it's just the illusion of choice. Mm -hmm. mm. Something that both this and the sequel, the uh, follow-up game, not just Bioshock 2, but the one after it, kind of leans into this idea of the illusion of choice. Which is an interesting thing to go into because a bad habit that, really, that was really emerging in the seventh generation was the Your Choices Matter thing, which we kind of talked about in the Mass Effect episode. Largely because it kind of was the accelerant for this, for this whole thing, which thankfully has mostly died off, at the very least, as a selling point. Yeah, the, 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 there became, like, it wasn't just choice itself, but also the, moral, the morality systems. And Bioshock also kind of dabbled with this, though very haphazardly, I'd say. <laughs> It's not how it handled it. It, it. It's not haphazard. The morals, the morals are very simple. Your moral choice comes in one place. Do you sacrifice innocent people who were experimented on for expedience, or do you empathize with people who were experimented on against their uh, will, at, f and possibly sacrifice um, resources that may be necessary? 
you 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 say that, and you're not wrong in how it was how it was con- conceived. But when you actually look at what happens when you make that choice, the game rewards you either way in pretty much the same amount. Because throughout the game, when you res- if you do decide to rescue the little girls, the, 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 the little sisters, eventually they start bringing rewards to you. You get a small amount of Adam from saving them, but then they bring you rewards of plasmids and more Adam to basically balance out what you would have gained if you had just decided to destroy them. So at the end of the day, it do- the choice doesn't really affect much other than the ending. Like, it literally well, only impacts the ending. Well, but let's let's be fair here, Chains. When the game first came out, you couldn't have known that's what the little sisters would do. For all you knew, because of the very first time you you either choose to fair or harvest a uh, a little sister, she says thank you, crawls back into her little wall hole, and you never see her again. At least that's fair. up until up until the first time after saving so many of them, that one of them pops out near one of the different... Uh, oh, God, what was the name of the vending machine for the... the pl- I guess the plasma machines, I would have said. Mm-hmm. Well, there was ones that specifically sold... Uh, yeah, that six, 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 I, I for, Something playground, I, I forget. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, uh, the... They'd come out near those, and sometimes they'd present you with a bottle of Adam, or sometimes they present you with a plasmid that you couldn't get any other way. There were there were a couple of plasmids they offered that you could not get from any of the vending machines or hidden in anywhere anywhere else in the game. Yeah. But this this particular this particular rewarding for for um, along a moral binary was something that was becoming very common it becoming very common in the in this generation. And I look at this as a um as a pro- as one a product of its time and two much like some of the moments in spec ops the line it's something it's something that loses its punch upon for upon further thought loses its punch and also um once you've played through the game once and seen it happen and you do the actual math because someone has actually done the math and uh it's up on game faqs if anybody wants to see it and go look at the very first bioshock uh uh, the probably the complete guide. Um, the the calculation of how much atom you get if you get every scrap of atom in the game without harvesting a little sister. Because there is some points where you find bottles of atom. Um, it's not enough of a deficit that you would miss out on anything by end of game. It only affects earlier builds. Yeah, but, uh, but what I mean, like haphazardly, in ter- it's less in terms of mechanics. And more narrative overall, because I would, I, in order for me to explain what I'm getting at here, let's compare it to a, a game that came around, came out not too long after or around the same time, that also had a moral syst- morality system. Infamous. Mm-hmm. Infamous's moral system, while also not perfect, I will freely admit this, was a lot more intrinsic in not only the the gameplay but the narrative. Because your actions in what choices you make affect how the world changes, how you change, what powers you have access to, things like that. Whereas with Bioshock, when you once you get past, once you start going, looking deeper in, you realize it doesn't affect anything other than that final ending cutscene. Mm-hmm. Everything else, how you play the game, is exactly the same. Except for that one choice. So, I'm not saying it's the worst system with moral choice. I'm just saying it was because of how early on it was. It had some kinks to work out. I, I don't think I don't think it was meant to be a moral decision, though. I think what it was meant to do was illustrate exactly what Ryan said: a man chooses, a slave obeys. And if you remember, the first time you come upon Little Sisters and learn about them and how you can get Adam from them, while Atlas does not say would you kindly, he definitely recommends that you harvest for the higher amount of Adam. Whereas Tenenbaum is like, please save them. 
even though she herself is no angel. That's a different story. Uh, yeah, yeah, obviously. But, uh, but and you're not wrong. You're not wrong on there. And I, and I and, and that's why I'm saying it's not the worst system. There is some value to it, and what you're saying point proves that. I'm just saying, be compared to other moral syst- other systems similar to it that have a bigger impact on things. Eh. <laughs> But well, there are I, others that just did it so haphazardly, I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm willing to say that the, the primary focus wasn't on the fact that it's a moral choice, but rather that it's a choice at all. Yeah. It's literally one of the... F- other than buying from vending machines, which you can only choose what to buy, not whether... Uh, not, you know, not whether that... Or whether or not to buy, but you can't choose, you know... Choosing from a vending machine, that's that's almost purely shop mechanics. That's how you restock in most cases. Yeah, um, you're, you're not wrong. I, and also, the point I'm also getting at is that the later game tends to actually go even further with the whole... We will definitely be getting to that later. <laughs> this is true. But um, it... In the end, the, the one the one truly impactful choice you have, and yes, while the impact is really only an ending... It's a pretty big impact con- considering Jack and his uh his particular He's a baby li- literally rapidly grown to adulthood within a, a few years and programmed. Okay people, let's just put it that way. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm yeah. not I'm not even kidding either. Fontaine programs programs him as an infant. There's a heavy implication he's one of Ryan's illegitimate children. Um and then sends him out of Rapture before its collapse which is only a few years prior to when you enter Rapture. So you were rapidly aged to a point where you're an adult. Yeah. And, and of course, the whatever it, uh, the 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 actual like canon sequel really kind of fucks up the ending choices since it's obvious it's based on one of the two can- one of the two endings. Yeah. <laughs> Which we'll get that. That's a whole topic for later. Mm-hmm. We won't get it. We won't get into the big sister. Only good part of that game, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, we'll t- we'll we'll be touching on that in a in a moment. Now, I'd say I'd if I'm being honest, it's much much like with System Shock Two. After the big reveal is when um is when things start to s- start to start to dip a, start to dip a little bit because of how constrained it ends up having to be yeah at that point like one every like well i wouldn't exactly call this game open there was a little more freedom to explore around but once you get to that point you're kind of stuck on a very specific path because you have to find the materials to break this break this programming Mm -hmm. which causes a whole series of problems when you get down to it when you find the first half of it and you're losing health over time. Yeah, I loved that part. Thanks, guys! No, and not just losing health, but also you are randomly switching plasmids and you and to and especially the ones that you don't want to use. Like you're in the middle of battle with a whole bunch of spices, and all of a sudden the, the plasmid changes to controlling big daddies, which you can't fucking use, and you're like, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? So, yeah. I never had Real I never had a problem with, with that part only because weapon wheel plasmid wheel slows down time. Which yeah, is, but I mean just just the the, the feeling of it is like of like it's I, awkward. Like, yes, it absolutely. It is awkward as hell. I was just I was so pissed off by the fact that I, I'm I'm pretty sure it wasn't just that you were losing health. You were losing max health. Yeah, your actual yeah. life bar was shortening, and it would only go back to what you previously had once you found the other half of the cure. Exactly, and then comes that second, the, the the other half of this problem, is the the requirements to actually get to Fontaine, where you have to go around this area, dress like up all, like a big daddy, get a just, little sister, just for the sake of a fucking escort mission, because we all just love those, don't we? Said I'm glad Monday. escort missions are slowly dying. Yes. Thank you, God. People, developers have learned we don't want that shit. If we're gonna have to carry someone around, one, keep them at a sa- at the same pace as we're going, not just halfway in between so that we can't walk or run. And two, 
Make it so that they're invulnerable so we don't have to worry about protecting their ass. We want to focus on killing shit. Oh, wait, invulnerable, un invulnerable followers? I wonder what game that's in. <laughs> it can't be a game we're talking about tonight. <laughs> Spoiler alert! It fucking is! <laughs> but when it comes to... When it comes... The other bit, the other, one of the other things that I did, I did want to touch on regarding, regarding the character of Rapture itself is that. I think it, I think it is, I think it is clear that on some level, um, they were, they were take, there is still, there is still that, um, sectioned off micro identity approach that you see in that you see in, well, si that you saw in System Shock as well as, a fair amount of Metroidvanias. Um, as far I know, some people try to do try to do a try to do a chicken and egg situation, but the original System Shock and Super Metroid came out a few a few mere months of each other. Meaning they were being developed at the same time, so it's mm -hmm. neither is inspired by the other. Yeah, but one thing that I do find kind of amusing, I've touched on this with certain FromSoft games and and with um but with Bioshock as well is. Being able to establish a horror atmosphere despite not being a horror game. Because yeah. how can I not talk about the plastic surgeon? <laughs> no, you, you mean the very first boss of the game? Yeah. I mean, he's technically a boss. Technically. Um, yeah, that guy who was like, Mmm, tasty, I'm going to make these... <sighs> I'm, I'm going gonna... to make you beautiful. Though my definition of beautiful is far beyond what you think it is. I'm going to do this little tuck here. But but now that I look at it, she could also use work on her nose. Doctor, no! Doctor, don't do that! I remember that audio log. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's such a good impact. And you but don't then... the... Sorry. <laughs> I remember, De I remember um, Derek Alexander, Stop Skeletons from Fighting. When when talking about when talking about how with um horror games said that the key thing is put is moving the player into a place where they shouldn't they don't want to be, and that partic that particular area is a is a classic case of env of environmental storytelling because as you get further and further into it things are more and more wrong. More and, and more lights we broken. Definitely see here. Yeah. More and more lights broken, more water leaking in, more splicers being even more insane than usual. And even just the environment itself, like, you know, you walk in, early on you're already seeing some small signs that things are off, like, you know, seeing the, 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 the one splicer watching over a, a baby carriage that just has a gun in it. But then when you get further in and you see, like, the couple who kill themselves mm -hmm. over their over thing, over, I believe it was over their daughter... Like, or the fact just... that the very first enemy you ever see that almost kills you but doesn't because it's all part of the tutorial opening is a fucking spider slicer. Yeah. Spider slicer. Mm -hmm. Like, the further in you go, and then, of course, tougher enemies like the aforementioned, like the Big Daddies, like, you see all of that, like, as the game goes on, they get they get harder, you see different variants of them that are even more ruthless and brutal. Like, the, every little thing about it just starts getting more and more, oh, God, what the hell happened here? The one good thing about the big daddies, they will not hurt you if you do not get too near the little sisters. That's yeah, all they're there for. Choose. You have to choose to go after them. Mm -hmm. And then Which, once you get the ability to harvest or save little sisters, they're a target. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, there's a big daddy there. Okay, do I have enough ammo? Do I got enough that uh, juice for my for my plasmids? Can I do this? Yep, let's go kick in that kick. Uh, let's go kick their ass. And then of course, oh god, he got me. I'm dead. <laughs> Electrical buckshot. That's all I can say. Which yeah, does oh, yeah. bring me to the one thing that a lot of people have said is the weakest part of Bioshock, and that is the use of the Vita chambers. Yeah. Honestly, like, I don't think that's as big of a problem. One, they did address that issue before along, if for those who did have that problem. But 
this was a game. This was a game that was clearly bent met, bent around the story. Like it was meant to be a story that you explore. It wasn't meant to be a challenge. You know, so they gave you a system where you could just infinitely revive. Now, could you have done some things to maybe make it a little challenging? Maybe cut down on the number of Vita Chambers? Or maybe you could have had them have a cost or something? Sure. But I don't think that would have eliminated the problem that people have had. It's a case of it was there so that you could just get through and enjoy the story. And, you know, the challenge is what you make of it. I look at it like this. The presence, of, the presence of that kind of thing is to beat is to beat it in your head to utilize the full, the um, multitude of options that you ha that you have, and that going in gu going in guns blazing is not always the best idea. Because one of one of the first introductions I had to gameplay when it came to Bioshock was them demonstrating the multiple ways to overcome a big daddy. And that go taking the taking the upfront route is probably not the best idea, but there are other ways you could do it. Things like things like messing around with the turrets, things things like um, things like going more indirect. Yeah, you know they give you a, they give you the the electrical plasma and show you hey if you shock the shock near if you use it near water, it'll shock everything around it. Thus, you can do damage that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and then combine that with stuff like hacking the turrets, whether it be the stationary or the floating kite, having a, basically a army of weapons that are just constantly firing on it while you're distracting it. You know, you, you can do so much to basically minimize the amount of damage you're taking while maximizing what you're throwing back. I will tell everyone right now the best way to fight a big daddy on the normal difficulty, because the upper difficulties, it's a different story. Tell me, because I still have to play these games. <sighs> <laughs> Level the hell out of your lightning plasmid, get electric buckshot, and alternate. Lightning, wait for the stun to come off, electric buckshot to knock him back and do another stun. Over and over again. Works on Basically literally every... Off. Yeah. Works on literally every big daddy in the game. I've done it personally. Mm -hmm. Thank you, senpai. Mm. <laughs> Never call me that again. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> however however when it comes to audio logs this is one of those things where i'm not going to say it was i'm not going to say it was pioneered by by um, bioshock but it certainly was an accelerant system, it, even system shock 2 had the audio logs it yeah. was just Bi bioshock popularized the idea and if i'm being if i'm being honest um, I think audio. I think when it's used properly, audio logs can be a great way to enhance environmental storytelling. However, the key word is when it's used properly, because a lot of games that have misused audio logs do so and do so in a manner where either a it's required, or b. The audio logs are way too, are way too long, and you have to stop what you're doing to listen to them. This is the reason why I kept I kept pe I kept poking fun at um, Dear Esther, because as well as um, Amnesia, a machine for pigs, and basically anything that the Chinese room has ever done. Uh, I have a better example, Monk. Hi, Gearbox. Hi, all of fucking Borderlands. <laughs> Yeah, I just I've been playing Borderlands 2 recently and while well, it was the audio logs are fucking it, terrible. Yeah, the fact that they have audio logs scattered about in random places that just don't tell you goddamn that that basically f flesh out the world, but you're going to be lucky if you even spot them in the wild because of how rare they pop up. Pain not in the mention, ass. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact some of them last 2, 3, even 4 minutes. And that's way too yeah. long. I I firmly believe that the sweet spot for an audio for an audio log is around a minute. Yeah, which Bioshock did do. They usually kept their audio logs rather brief, mm -hmm. just long enough for you to. Now, there was a couple of them that did go a little long, but most of them tended to be just long enough for you to get the idea of what was going on, and you were able to just, you, you know, usually you could take a minute while after you've cleared a room, check the audio log while you're searching the rest of the place, and you're good to go. The only audio logs that went longer usually were the ones that were labeled as diaries. So you knew you were getting in for something longer. Mm -hmm. 
but I'd say, but even with that, it's not it's not like it's one hundred percent necessary to go through every audio log in order to in order to enjoy the story in front of you. Oh no, it was a good, it was tasters. Mm-hmm. Like every everything that you got, like you would have found Mister Plastic Surgeon to be a creepy motherfucker because of the way he literally crucified women that didn't meet his standards on operating tables and hung them in his operating theater. Sure. You would you yeah. would be plenty creeped out by that motherfucker. Yeah, no, finding I, some I, of the audio logs fleshed that out just a little bit worse. That and exactly. the whole that and the whole idea of him of him hearing the voice of Aphrodite in his head. Oh boy. Now, you want to know a good example of audio of audio logs that really annoyed me? Is the kind of audio logs where there was essential or at least essential or rather important information buried within. And the good example for me on that Doom 3. When you're hiding locker codes with important weapons or gear inside of an audio log, you have pissed me off. Oh, there, there are. Believe me when I say there's um, there's a much bi- there's a much bigger fish that I have to fry when it comes to Doom 3, namely the <laughs> shotgun. I know. I just wanted to use point use that as an example of uh, of a bad kind of yeah. audio log. And I I know some I know some people bring up the journal entries that that are in games like Resident Evil or the Good Alone in the Dark, that being the first one. But if I'm being if I'm being honest with those, they are they are highly optional, and are more of, more of a rel- more of a artifact of point and click adventure games. And I I know I've picked on the idea of point and click. I don't hate point and click adventure games. It's just that there are certain entries and certain habits that that genre has that annoy me. Look at you, King's I, Quest. I was about to say oh, hi, King's. I was about to say hi, King's Quest. Hi, Hitchhiker's Guide. No panic. No, note note to self: Never play the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy point and click game because there are steps that you don't know you need to do that you will never think of to do without a guide. Um. Even if you've read the books, because I have, and you will lose in the first, like, ten minutes. You won't be able to complete the game. Period. End of story. <laughs> like, the simple fact of, where do you get a container to hold the babel f- fish before you put it in your ear? <laughs> Otherwise, it goes down the drain on the floor, and you lose. That's it. That's the end of game, right there. Mm-hmm. It's like the Grim Fandango uh, scenario, where you have, you know, you have no choice but to... T- but to try everything and hope to God something makes sense to proceed. <laughs> I like to call this kind of thing hand breaking. Hmm. The polar opposite of hand holding. And I pick on King's Quest in particular because every King's Quest game I've played has this problem. Every King's Quest game has a guide damn it moment. And for those of you who don't know what guide damn it is, go look over on TV Tropes. Mm hmm. <laughs> Now that being that being said, with all with all of the mat- with with all of the material that that um was present with um with but within bio within the original Bioshock and incidentally, the prequel novel is not bad. I would re- I would recommend reading it if you're if you're a diehard. But there are certain things that contradict. Now. This brings us to Bioshock 2, which, while it while it made a few waves when it came out, it's largely been swept under the rug, and I'd like to I'd like to explore why that is. I think I think one of the big reasons is that it a lot of it was more of the same. Absolutely, even though you could now semi mix plasmids to make like traps and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that you're playing a big daddy, ooh. Um, even though you, even though you were effectively playing a big daddy in all but name in the th- in the third act. Exactly. I'm not. Kind of kills that whole point. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Um, c- contradicting that. In fact, that's why I said it as sarcastically as I did. Mm-hmm. Um, the the, I I should actually say that. Jack didn't play as a big daddy. It was Jack in Big Daddy cosplay. Delta doesn't play like a big daddy either. Delta plays as Delta as if he were Jack. With a few extra powers. 
it, it does not feel like a big daddy at all. And that, that kind of takes away from the immersion of the idea. Like, you want to feel like you're playing a big daddy. Or else, what's mm -hmm. the fucking point? Mm -hmm. But the there are two there are two major problems with with within um within Bioshock Two that I think I think didn't exactly help. One is the fact that you for the that um the rapture that you're exploring, even though it's it's had a accelerated decay, is still looks is still looks on paper far too similar to the rapture that you had explored in the first game. It's likely they just took the assets from the first game and just kind of re rejiggered them a little bit. That I'm willing to bu I'm willing to buy because they also had to cram in that multiplayer mode that was absolutely terrible. unnecessary. It was terrible and unnecessary. Nobody needed to pl to play as different factions in the Rapture Civil War. No one yeah. wanted it. It was it, the only reason that that was added at the time was because every FPS had one, mm -hmm. and, and probably somebody higher up at like either I think Microsoft or whatever. Take two, two K. Take take two, yeah. Two K would have absolutely right. pulled this shit. Mm -hmm. You know they would. Where they basically said, "Uh, you got you know every other FPS is doing it. You got to have a multiplayer, but we doesn't really fit with it. I don't care. You got to have it." Now, fortunately. Irrational didn't do the multiplayer themselves. They, uh, it was, um, it was, it was, he it was handed off to a different studio. Um, I can't, I can't recall who it was, but it's kind of like how Certain Affinity handled the multiplayer for Doom 2016. Mm -hmm. And this is not, this is not an uncommon thing. No, a lot of, a lot of studios do that because. Obviously, they know that their main developers, if they're known for making single player stuff, they're not going to be able to handle a multiplayer setup. That's not their that's not their specialty. So you're going to hand it off to people who actually do make that as a regular thing. Yeah. Uh, when it came to Spec Ops: The Line, Jaeger outright refused to do the multiplayer part. Good. And it w and it was handed off to a whole other studio, which um. Was very very clearly did a rush job given how, given the level of omni broken that certain that um certain weapons were, including having pistols with laser pinpoint accuracy. <laughs> there they were true hit scans again. I remember mm -hmm. hit when scan making, pistols. When, when you're making the shoot through wall sniper rifle from Perfect Dark look like a viable weapon, you know you fucked up. I'd have gone with the laptop gun, but that's just me. <laughs> Still, you know, you get my point, though. Mm -hmm. I would have gone with Red Faction 2's rail gun with the X-ray scope. <laughs> that thing was busted, and it outlined enemies in a square, so you could know what you were looking at through the squall through the walls. Yeah, this pretty much the same thing, just done even worse. If I hadn't made mm. it clear by this point, I fucking hate campers. <laughs> but the uh, the. <sighs> The other part of that the reason that uh, Bioshock Two uh, fell off uh, was the story. First yeah. of all, the revisionist, adding yeah. elements that did not exist originally, adding it, elements it, that did not exist, and the th the theme of of um the of the Rapture family uh, and this uh, and basically trying to double down on a on that greater good um I greater good idea. Was a little bit too, was a little bit too similar to certain ideas we saw in the first game. Not to mention the fact that it it also pointed out that there actually was like an aristocracy in Rapture, which was weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that like, didn't that's, that that was goes against exact anything that Andrew Ryan would have created. What's like, the passage that you see that. when you ent when you enter Rapture through the bathysphere? No gods, no kings, only man. Yeah. So to have a hierarchy like that, yeah, that just seems like whoever wrote the story, whoever wrote the story was not the same people behind the first game because it was it's obvious they did not understand the story of Rapture. Yeah. And then just like they failed to make you feel like a big daddy, they also failed to make the game as harrowing as it was in the first one. The closest like, thing that you get it's hard to do it's hard to do that level of harrowing when you already know when you know so much about Rapture. 
Yeah. And the only thing that the only thing that leans into any degree of harrowing is the big sister who who um Resident Evil veterans would be like, well look at that and go that's a little bit too close to Nemesis. It's just Nemesis with extra steps and tits. Mm-hmm. And the pro the pro and I'm not I'm not saying that the idea of of this nigh un, of this nigh unkillable enemy that keeps chasing you down is a bad thing. I've used I've used it my fair share of times in my own campaigns. The problem is when that when that's the only thing that spices things up, you have you have an issue. And she only spices things up until you get enough plasmids and weapons. Once you have the options, she is a joke. Doesn't matter how late in the game you are. Once you've got all those options. Oh yeah, she's supposed to adapt with every encounter. No, you can't adapt to the fact that I have some of the most overpowered plasmid combinations in the game and can use them on you to keep you stunlocked again, which shouldn't be possible with the big sister, and then dump buckshot into your head. And this is what this is why comparing it to say Nemesis or the Sand Wraith is an, is interesting because with those um one, whenever they show up, it's it's a little bit more like a set piece, especially the Sand Wraith in um, Prince of Persia, Warrior Within. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but two, you can't kill them. You can't kill them, you can't knock them out. I, I, if you want another example of this idea of a, of a threatening specter that once, you, that once you're properly leveled isn't all that threatening, consider death in Persona 3. Yeah, because if you encounter the Death Shadow early on in, in the in the Tower of Tartarus, that's basically game over for you. Mm -hmm. But once you're leveled enough or have enough Persona or, or, and uh, and have fused some really powerful combinations and all that fun shit, um, you, next time you encounter Death, you turn him into a joke and you get some really cool shit out of killing him. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are some people who start using Death as a as a farm an xp grind i look at them and i go yeah yeah i understand why you're doing that don't hate the player <laughs> hate the game oh i'm not <laughs> hating i no, did it not. myself he's, a couple he's times not are. he's pointing that out like you mm -hmm. know people who would bitch about something like that yeah don't hate the player hate the game mm -hmm. <laughs> the player's being smart and you didn't make your game properly to counterbalance that that's your own fault yeah and when it comes when it comes to and when it came to the bit, when it came to the big, when it came to the idea of the big sisters, um, on one hand, on one hand, using that, there's supposed to be the doubling down about family, especially with all, especially with all of the different endings invo involved with Bioshock Two, because it, because there's a lot more different ways that that the game can end. The pro the problem is, you're. You're um, de it's dealing with a character that you're not that you're not seeing directly. So a lot of the a lot of the ways that it ends feel ki feel kind of off. And li and like I said, like I said, it's ki it's um, what you see what you see is a, is something of a bad ha of a bad habit of of writers in this series and. Going forward, and writers in other works, of not putting, not even putting in subtext, but putting in text and calling it subtext. I'd say a good, I'd say a good example of this is JT and JT and I had recently seen the Batman, and there were a handful of times where it seemed like there, it seemed like they would present the film would present a certain theme. But then not go further into it and ju and just focus on something else. That's just a recent example of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think th I think that the res that the results of Bioshock Two was enough of a sign to say, okay, we can't we can't keep dipping into Rapture. If we do, if we do, we're gonna run this into the ground, or we're gonna, we're gonna pull an Activision with Guitar Hero. Yeah, we all know how that turned out. 
Bye bye, fake guitar playing guy. <laughs> well, you say that, but there's still a market for that going on these days. Just not by Activision themselves. No, you've got Clone Hero, and you've got and you've got speedrunners getting caught cheating. Mm-hmm. Wait, what? Again? Yeah. They have people are cheating at fucking Guitar Hero. Um. What? Go on. Go. Carl Jobs did a good video on the matter. Go watch I, it. Go I, watch that. I've wa I've watched Carl Jobs stuff. I, I know what you're talking about. I just don't didn't realize it was happening again. There was the there was the one big incident that that and that's the one I was referring to. Ah, uh, okay. Um. But I think that I think when it I think the fact that it took, that there was a wide gap between the release of 2 and the announcement of infinite is kind, is kind of showing that they that they knew they needed to start fresh with the idea with the idea in some form mm -hmm. and you know how you know how there's been a but if i'm being honest um bioshock Inf bioshock infinite is obviously it's nowhere near as good as the original bioshock and while while some pe I know some people really defend it, I have some significant problems with it. One of the big ones that I have that I have is how how P Columbia is presented to me. Now one would one would think, based on based on how based on its appearance and else and elsewise, that Columbia is meant to be an exploration of American exceptionalism. Especially since that mindset was get, was pretty commonplace around the around the time of those world's fairs that ha that happened in New York. Except the problem, except the actual story, doesn't focus on that at all. No, instead, we're focusing on dimensional tears and causality and shit. Yeah, like. They they try to make it seem like that's going to be about that, and even during some of the early cause, even during some of the shifts in timeline that you go through, they kind of try to keep that narrative going. But by the end, you kind of realize how irrelevant all of that was. The other the other big problem I have is that the the um, story attributes that they actually use are far too much of a of a leap from something that had. Up until this point, had had kept itself squarely in the realm of speculative science fiction. Yeah, here this one goes pretty heavy-handed into some agendas, and I don't mean that in some in some wokeism thing, but rather, rather the fact that it go, that it's going into things that border on the supernatural. And while alt while um, alternate dimensions and causality and the like have been utilized in science fiction plenty of times, when you're going from one style of science fiction to another, it's a bit of a whiplash. Yeah. Also, that fucking ghost. Fuck her. <laughs> fuck her and the vi and the veil she rode in on. Um. On top of that, the uh, the science the quote unquote science fiction that is in Infinite is <clears throat> something no one would have speculated on in the late eighteen hundreds. It's out of place. It's anachronistic in the extreme to have a flying city with full on robots. Yeah, they they go on to full on quantum mechanics go. Uh try to justify how they created the city and it makes no fucking sense half the time like even Matt Pat did a video on game theory about how this shouldn't be a thing let's cons <laughs> let's let's bring a let's bring a point of comparison rapture was rapture was built up the idea of an underwater city is certainly a stretch but the, but at the very least the utilization of of technology at the of technology at the time certainly makes certainly makes sense in a way that you can wrap your head around. Not that it's re not in the realism sense, but in the I can believe I can believe this particular bullshit. 
Well, and they also show that it didn't quite work out because we knew, even by the time by the first game we get there and the place is falling apart. So it clearly didn't work as well as people thought it would. Whereas, without const without constant maintenance, nothing underwater does. Mm -hmm. I, I I'd like to just get on the details a little bit about what does make sense within the time period it takes in. Bathospheres were definitely a thing by that point. A mm -hmm. bathosphere is an underwater submersible that is pressurized, usually in the name in the in the shape of a, shape of a sphere. Um, we'd been using them for a while. Uh, <clears throat> the man that uh, that Jules Verne, I believe, based Leagues Under the Sea off of uh, Jacques Cousteau was even involved in using some submersibles and bath bathospheres. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a pressurized environment being permanently installed under the sea was already talked about as a military thing because of the cold war um all of this stuff plus you know the fact that andrew ryan was trying to appease and appeal to the creme de la creme of the science community not only is it yeah i can believe this bullshit there is a level of verisimilitude and actual authenticity that could be pulled for this type of sci-fi the speculative science fiction fucking columbia first of all are those supposed to be balloons they're flying on where the fuck are they getting the fuel the yeah like they they first try to make it look like it's the floating balloons and then they turn around when they when when you start to realize there's no way that could work, they start to you bring up the whole quantum mechanics bullshit to try to justify it. And quantum mechanics was barely even a thing at that point. Well, quantum mechanics as, as publicly known was barely a thing at that point. I mean, Michio Kaku has been doing quantum and theoretical physics for near on 40 years. Um, the, the type of quantum mechanics that they bandied about in infinite, in infinite, uh, was just they had many worlds theory they had uh things that, that used un in incorrectly used certain quantum mechanics to try and explain levitation mm -hmm. um i don't even remember the specifics they were so bad the ultimately the the one thing that i thought was m that made more sense than anything else was the robotics except for the songbird yeah <laughs> there's no way something like, like that could have existed like the like the like the patriots the patriots that were basically your elite enemies with two fucking mini guns that you had to beat i could see that i could ostensibly see something that big and bulky being a robot in that time period it for if again cream of the crop creme de la creme of the actual science and, and engineering community was there um but the fucking songbird? The songbird can suck my dick. That thing couldn't even exist today. And we've got way better uh, materials and flight measures than could even be possibly thought of or implemented then. No, mm. fuck you. Fuck you, songbird. Suck a dick. You weren't even scary. You were silly. And the other thing... That brings us to the successor of sorts to plasmids, which is just new and interesting forms of whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Plas pla it, it's plasmids. It's it's plasmids. It, it's just plasmids with a new with a new name. Literally just slap a new name on it, there you go. Yeah, the the whole the whole you're drinking that you're drinking from a bottle to get to get the effects is something I wasn't able to let slip. Instead of injecting yourself like you did with plasmids, yeah, at, le at least with plasmids, there was it was pseudoscience. It was made up bullshit, but at least you could see the logic behind it. But with the vigors, yeah, that 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 they're, they're just pulling shit out of their ass now. Mm -hmm. With with with, I'll, I'll give a perfect example. With the electric plasmid, what I could see it doing is overhyping how a an electric eel creates an electric field and allowing you to emit that. Since that, since the whole thing about the the electricity plasmid was shooting lightning bolts out of your hand, and the whole thing about plasmids in general was splicing your DNA, that's why the splicers were called splicers. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all. That's all nice and dandy. 
there were a few plasmids in the games that didn't quite make sense. Um, I mean, like, I don't know how you're supposed to create a tornado with a plasmid, but, you know, I digress. A vigor that allows you to shoot crows! What? You don't summon them, you just shoot them. What? I... I... I'm calling it now. Bioshock Infinite is nothing but uh, Booker's dying dream when he overdosed on some fucking drug. Which, uh, you know, that actually would make sense, all things considered. I think that's a good. I think that's as good of an opportunity as any to dis to discuss some of the problems that we that we kind of end up having with Booker Dewitt as a character. That, that um is is a classic case of the things that we dis that we discussed when we talked about silent protagonists. It, it, did he have a character? I don't remember Booker having a character. What are you talking it's about? It's implied that he has a character with backstory, but we never, but we never see it. We're just, we're just, we're just told about it. The Especially when he talks to problem. himself. Mm -hmm. He talks to himself, people, and that's how you get to know about Booker because he talks to himself. Yeah. Not that that gives him any more personality than before. And. On, and when you consider what we learn about the main villain Comstock by the end, it makes that makes it even more hilarious. <laughs> Spoilers for yeah. Infinite: Comstock is just another world version of Booker. Uh huh. No need Spoilers. to put in the spoiler warning because statutes passed. Yeah, exactly. I'm but saying the, it as a as a form of satire, Monk. Well, well but this is also brings up one of the one of the uh, one of the motifs of Bioshock and Infinite. The illusion of choice. Mm -hmm. Like, it was somewhat present in the original Bioshock, but here it is, front and fucking center. Literally, like, the minute you get to Columbia, the illusion of choice becomes a very prevalent thing, where you're presented with what seems to be choices, but they end up having no impact on anything. They don't do anything. Like the point where you're asked to throw a ball at, a, at an interracial couple. All day went better. Like, you're supposed to choose between the bird and the cage medallion. It literally does nothing. I know. <laughs> I know. Even the smallest of things. Even the smallest but, uh, of things, there's, there's the whole thing of him being a, vet a, um, a veteran, veteran of the Battle of Wounded Knee. But because of the fact that we're, n that we're not, we're in no, pl we're in a place where that battle is not going to be relevant. Um, it's hard. It's once again tell. Once again, tell don't show. And let's not forget the fact that there's a very specific mark on the back of one of his hands that is used to indicate him as the source of all evil. Yes, that's right, everybody. Booker Dewitt has a blue check mark on the back of his hand. <laughs> I think um, no need no need to lower Booker DeWitt to the level of blue check marks. I don't know. They're both pretty uh, pretty bland and have no character. Why not? Yeah. And I I know some people I know some people have used this as an example of of a certain bland character archetype that was rampant throughout those times. But um, sometimes but a lot of people seem to use that to say to say that it was coordinated when. In reality, it's just a series of coincidences. People are going to use that Jimmy Neutron um, clip of coincidence. I think not. Either that, or the fair, Fairly Godparents, uh, Fairly Godparents uh, clip of of Crocker saying Fairy Godparents. Mm -hmm. mm. I think, I think, in some regard, if they're going to if they're going to use a Fairly Oddparents gif, they'd probably use Dinkelberg. <laughs> <laughs> But the the big once again the big problem is that with with uh, is that because of the because even when Booker is talking to himself we don't get a whole lot of we don't get a whole lot of insight with him the reveals that you're supposed to be shocked by don't stick. Yep, and because uh, they're told to you. In a way that's very boring. 
like if he, if there if there were if there were cases of of right of him doing inner monologues to himself during downtimes, a la RDM in the metro in the uh, metro series, or the or the journal entries that Samus has in Metroid Fusion, I'd be a little more willing to buy it. Mm. But it's but they don't but they don't. Which brings me to the thing that en that ends up being the true hero of the story, you j with your ki with Booker just being a passenger. Let's talk about Elizabeth. <laughs> you mean you mean the 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 one character that's actually interesting, and also mildly infuriating. I'm sorry. You know how the you know how with two there was there was this idea there was this idea of um of try of trying to have a have a theme of family without really fully exploring it just text instead of subtext. Yep. You have this problem even further with with Booker's relationship with Elizabeth. Primarily because he's her father. Yeah, like. From the another is, you find reality. Out, yeah. You you, uh, you find out at the end of the game. Well, throughout the game, you learn that he had made a decision that he had meant, and he regrets deeply, and that's where kind of lead him on this quest into Columbia. That regret was that out of desperation, because of how low he had reached, he had sold his daughter to pay off his debts. But he immediately realized that was a bad idea, and tried to get her back from the people that had taken him. Not knowing that the, that one of them was Zachary Comstock, a.k.a. himself. Which... Note to self, unless you know exactly what you're doing, don't involve time travel or alternate selves in your story. Let, let's not forget, though, that there's a third book, Booker DeWitt in, involved in all this, i.e. the Booker DeWitt that lost Elizabeth through a portal, and that's how she lost her pinky. Yeah, that was the original thing, was like that that Booker tried tried to get her back, rest, tried to wrestle her away from Comstock, and as the portal closed, it basically sliced her finger off. I mean, what would you do if your pinky was in two places in space at the same time, and all of a sudden, that space was separated again. The thing, the finger separates too, rather cleanly. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are. We are now up to three bookers in the equation. It only gets worse. <laughs> the, we have the I, booker that sold his daughter. We have Zachary Comstock, the guy who created Columbia, who is somehow much older than the Booker Dewitt that's actually in his own timeline. Because again, because uh, quantum fuckery. And then we have the Booker that lost Elizabeth through a hole in time and space. It seems that the idea, the idea that they want to go with when it, when it comes to this illusion of choice is all is all these different is with all these different variants. But once again, we ha once again, I know I I know I keep saying it, I know it's getting repetitive, but I have to keep bringing it up. We have the issue of telling, not showing. Mm-hmm. And in and this brings me to this also brings me to the to the fact that you know how we've te how we've talked about how we absolutely despise escorts. That's mm -hmm. a lot of what a lot of what Elizabeth does is is I'd say worse than an escort, a guide. Yeah, it pulls the it pulls the exact same problem that people got fu infuriated with. With a lot of those modern military shooters back in the day, the what I like to call the Ramirez problem, mm -hmm. where you are where you are constantly taking orders from someone else as they guide you through things, with the illusion that you're doing it because you want to because you want to uh, appease her. Mm-hmm. Now, at the very at the very least, with a lot of military shooters, you can kind of get away with it when it's a superior officer, or somebody mm -hmm. who has more stake, or somebody who's just a force of personality, like say McTavish in Modern Warfare. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, if he tells you to march somewhere, you're marching somewhere. <laughs> but Elizabeth is none of these things. No. 
and that's that's what makes it all the more infuriating. I will, however, have to, as I always, I must give the devil of their due. Uh, Elizabeth is useful in a yes. few ways. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth throws useful items to you in the middle of combat, such as health uh, health potions and and uh, your vigor refills, which I don't remember what salts are called. Salts here, yeah. Instead of Eve for the Adam and Eve thing back in a Rapture, <clears throat> um, and, and, or if you're in certain arenas, she can tear open small holes once you get to a certain point in the story to put in things from another reality in these little tear areas, things like turrets or robots that'll work on your side for a little bit, things like that. And, most of all, she's fucking invincible! <laughs> you don't have to protect the bitch! Yeah! <laughs> Regar regardless, the problem, st the problem still is that you are, you are not, you are not um, naturally exploring Columbia. No, you're not. You're being escorted through it. And while while Rapture was never a full on open world, there was still an there was still a relatively open sandbox. I like to equate it to the tiers and tent poles analogy I use quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You had met all roads lead to Rome, but you had many roads that led there. So at the very least, there's the there's a degree of freedom. But with Columbia, which a floating city mi mixed with the um, mixed with the sky hooks to get from place to place, you think you you think you'd have a whole lot more options. And if you want if you want to see if if I were to use a better ex if I were to use a better example for this kind of thing, consider the the li the likes of um of cer of certain arenas in Titanfall Two. Mm -hmm. Titanfall Two is a ver is a very linear affair. This much is true. But with certain er with certain areas, the there is a much larger degree of openness. Or hell, let me if since we since we bring it up a lot, let's use Doom Eternal. You've got pretty damn open arenas. The store you have a you it is linear, but it but um once those arenas come in, it's a case of here's a bunch of enemies trying to kill you. Have fun. Mm hmm And you but you don't really you don't have that you don't have that degree of freedom. And I I want to make something clear. I in no means in no way am asking for. Columbia to turn into to turn into a UB box. That is the complete opposite of what I'd want. What I am what I am saying, however, is that a, is that a degree of experimentation with the toolkit needed to um, needed to exist. And in this regard, even though it's nice to have Elizabeth helping you in this regard. Her help actually bottlenecks this kind of thing. Because because of the fact that she because of the fact that her help uh, minimizes the bad moves that you could do. Yeah, you you. <clears throat> if anything, this could be called a catered experience. You are in an amusement park. Hmm. Riding rails, rather than in a sandbox. Another thing we take. No, never, never mind. Sorry, never mind. No, go ahead, JT. No, no, I, I answered my own question. Okay. Um, this is, I mean, this is something we also tend to criticize when it's used in contexts where it doesn't need to be, because there's always a context where a catered experience is going to be probably the most enjoyable vehicle by which you make an experience. Mm -hmm. But the experience has to fit that. This is not one of them. No, because no, because of the because of the fact that things are so laid out for you. Um, the sweet irony is the the um, Bioshock Infinite board game has a better understanding of this. 
a board game, something that is ostensibly more on rails than anything else, a better idea of what not to do about catered experiences. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And grant, granted, it's trying to go for a specific experience that the game isn't because, well, different mediums. Yeah. But the point still stands. And I've tr I've tried to th I've tried to think of of what um what Bioshock Infinite should have done, and I'd I'd say um this is a bit of a theory that I've had. I feel like the I feel like the shift into quantum bullshit um ended up ha ended up happening because of a because of a writing direction change midway through development. It does feel like that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think that if they had, I, I feel like that if they had gone further in on the idea of Columbia being a sit, being a floating city, being built bu built on the ideas of American exceptionalism, or even just a Bond villain style island, it probably would have worked out a lot better. Because the the problem with Columbia is that is that it's a is that for the story it's trying to tell it's a waste. Whereas, for say what you will about Rapture, it was it was built on exploring that uh, that idea of objectivism that uh, that um, Ryan had, and exposing all of the flaws, which is yeah. how yeah. how speculative SF tends to work. Yeah, with Rapture and the original Bioshock. The objectivism ideals that Ryan had was the centerpiece of the story. Every, you know, the, the whole thing with Fontaine was showing the flaws in it, but it was still very much at the center of what the, I, what the story was about. When you look at Columbia, the exceptionalism, it just kind of sticks. It's just kind of there as a set piece. Mm -hmm. Like, they try to make it seem like it's the centerpiece, but once you get to the end, you realize it has nothing to do with what's going on. Everything you did to help the Vox did nothing. And, and uh, if you want to do the, if you want to do that sort of personal story, that sort of personal story about somebody trying to seek redemption, then do it. But you, you can't half-ass. Half it. Ass, yeah, you can't um, have it both ways. Which is what they tried to do, and you know what you know what happens when you try and please everyone. You piss off everyone. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's let's uh, let's let's touch briefly on the fact that there's an entire DLC for uh, for Bioshock Infinite that deals with Rapture. Oh yes, Beyond the Sea, Aerial aka sea. aka Irrational Games' apology tour. Yep, Burial at Sea. Burial at Sea. Um, a version of Elizabeth somehow got into Rapture. Because that makes sense. And for uh. whatever reason, can see the future, which once again, once again, you're trying you're trying to turn an SF series into full on fantasy. I can see the future. That meme never dies. Mm. Nope. <laughs> but you also have her exploring exploring areas that we really didn't need to have explored. It felt like. It felt like the sole reason for Burial at Sea to exist is to try and tie Infinite with the same universe as um, the original Bioshock. Which is stupid. They didn't need to be the same universe. You didn't have now, to make them the same universe. Hell, the second... I, I was just double-checking this, because I never played the Burial at Sea DLCs. The second episode seems to imply that Elizabeth had a hand in, the event, in setting up the events of the original. Yes. The, the whole burial at sea thing basically says uh, Bioshock 1 happens because Elizabeth fucks everything up. And you want to you know what you want know what I'm reminded of? Um the lo the the lore issues that people have been having regarding the God Emperor of Mankind and some of the and some of the really dumb retcons that people have been trying to do with him over the last few years the idea that he wasn't solely responsible for some of the things that he's that he's attributed to whether that whether that be the um whether that be the astartes legiones pro, pro 
um, program, or the or the Primarchs, or the or the idea that he just found the Golden Throne instead of had it made. Those the revisionist history is stupid, and I hate it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's fictional history or real, um, <laughs> why you needed to tie together. Bioshock Infinite with Bioshock 1, and also imply that all the events of Bioshock 1 take place the way they do because Elizabeth was involved, is fucking stupid. I, 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 if I, if I, if I could be a fly on the wall during the, the during the planning of the DLC, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna throw it out there. I think someone on the writing team didn't like someone else from the writing team on one. <laughs> my suspicion is that is that they were far too infatuated with uh, with how elizabeth got really popular with with um with fan art and cosplaying and they tried to give people more elizabeth i'd liken it to when um the writers for westworld which is a ca is a classic case of a good show that had seasonal rot um we're actively playing into the the um, subculture of lore speculators and wi and wiki editors in season two, and they outright admitted it, and it was a very very dumb thing to do. And the well, the proof is in the pudding with subsequent seasons of Westworld. But. The fa the fact that the fact that they try that they tried to ham fist Il um Elizabeth in it very much fe very much felt like more fan art and cosplay fodder which you're gonna you're gonna see that anyways when you have a good when you have a good enough character design no need to blatantly try and pander to that plus um maybe it's just me but that whole episodic thing. Felt like they were trying to do um do the do um the half life thing, or they were trying to just milk it. Actually, hold on. When did when did the DLCs for Infinite first start trying to come out? <sighs> Let me pull a flutter for a moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. 2013 and 2014. I don't think... Uh, I don't think that was actually um, trying to capitalize on Half-Life at that point. No, I was be I was being somewhat facetious, but it was definitely trying to do. But the whole, the whole episode thing, um, which is cert which is certainly a hallmark of early PC gaming. But trying to but trying to do that sort of episodic DLC in that regard, never stuck, and I'm kind of glad that it didn't. Yeah, instead we now just get episodic games. <sighs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go down that particular rabbit hole. And in terms of in terms of the future, we haven't heard we haven't heard much as far as if Irrational Games is even working on anything these days. There was that brief point where they were apparently trying to work on a System Shock Three, but uh, as we mentioned earlier, that kind of fell through. Yeah, the the System Shock Three thing and the and its association with Overkill or Starbreeze or whatever they're calling this this week to to avoid getting raided by the Swedish government again is a issue. And of course, of course, that drags the System Shock remake down with it. Mm -hmm. Also known as System Shock Blue Edition. Seriously, there's a lot of blue. <laughs> so much blue. This baby can fit so much blue. Oh, I'm surprised they didn't. I'm surprised they didn't contract Eiffel 65 to do the music. 
<laughs> oh god. Yeah, look at screenshots of the System Shock remake shades. You'll see a lot of blue. But the but if I'm if I'm being honest, if they are to handle another another System Shock, I think one thing that they need to do is nail down the fact that they are that what makes something like Bioshock work what is the same thing that makes speculative science fiction work. Trying to do something in fantastical and claiming that you're still doing s speculative science fiction isn't going to cut it. And if you if you're go if you're going to ha if you're going to have a silent protagonist with a if you're going to have a protagonist with a backstory, don't try and act like it's a silent protagonist. Uh huh. If you need a if you need a companion, oh fine. Just make sure that the companion doesn't get in the way or become the show. Because let's be honest, when people think when. But before before we get into that, I do want to touch on one final thing with Infinite, and that is the ending. Ho 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 ho! Now we're getting to the shit. The idea that the so that the true choice to solve the, to solve this massive Gordian knot paradox is no choice, and let all the different variations of Elizabeth drown you. Because if you drown, she can't be born, and thus the whole thing falls apart quantumly. N yeah. Of course, that I'd like to point out that that actually um, <clears throat> destroys the many worlds theory that they had been taking and using that entire time, because drowning one Booker would not drown them all. Not to mention, uh, then you then you're dealing with paradoxes when you think about it. Multiverse theories, a bitch. <laughs> It, no, I think I got a better button for this that I've been uh, saving for up until this point. Where is that button? Do I not have it in here? Oh, fuck me. Not our oh. job. Go ask your wife. <laughs> Give me a minute. I, I, I need to have this button set up for this because this button needs to be played when it comes to dealing with any kind of time travel story, period. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Here it is. Time travel is bullshit. You want to know how? You want to know how many? How many? Um, sto how many stories I can think of that actually use time travel somewhat properly? I can count them on one hand. Two, not two games. Two stories. Period. One of them, even though even though the story wasn't great, at least they tried to make their time travel somewhat believable, is Quantum Break. The other, it was okay. The other is a certain time travel mo move. Is a, is a certain time travel movie from two thousand four. Yep. And whenever I bring this up, people people say, "Well, what about Back to the Future? What a, what a, what about um?" They go, they give me a bunch of what abouts Back to the Future, and some Toku fans bring up Kamen Rider Denno. Um, neither of them are good examples because they both fall under their own weight when it comes to paradoxes. That eventually, and then of course, uh, go ahead. <clears throat> I was gonna say. They're entertaining movies in and of themselves, but when you actually break down the ti the time travel mechanics, that's when things start to fall apart. And you want to know you want to know what movies are good for time travel that uh that that achieve being good uses of time travel in a different way, Monk. What? Bill and Ted. <laughs> because they just ignore the consequences of time travel entirely. They don't give a fuck. They want to tell an amusing story, they want to use time travel to achieve it, and they tell an amusing story and ignore the fact that you're traveling through time to achieve it. I had somebody try and argue with me that Chrono Trigger should be used as an example of good use of time travel. Which, I love Chrono Trigger to death, but no. 
first the first uh, the first series of Steins Gate. That's that's a good that's some good shit. No no JT has a point. Mm-hmm. Steins Gate is an excellent use of time travel because nobody's actually traveling through time, just electronic messages are. It it's just time it's just timeline management is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and uh, anyone who who likes visual novels and or anime, um, Steins Gate, G- go play, go watch now. Very good shit. Also, make sure to order a six pack of Dr Pepper before you do. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Duke P. That is the only. That is the only drink we accept here. El Sai Congru. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, though, st- uh, though, uh, uh, special note, just because someone's going to ask, Steins Gate Zero. Play the novel. Don't watch the anime. Anime is terrible. The anime is... Zero anime is terrible. I hear... From what I hear, the novel is the way to go. Mm-hmm. But you, you can... But honestly, just do yourself a favor and just do just do Steins Gate itself. That, that, that's, that's where the good stuff is. Yeah. Yep. So... Th- there you go. Examples of how hard it is to get time travel right. Either the story, <laughs> in order to be good, ignores time travel completely. Hi, Bill and Ted. Or, Excellent. <laughs> yes. Or t- uh, keeps keeps the time travel logic tracked extremely well. And, and gives some very hard, definite rules. For how time travel has to be mag- managed, and time travel has to be used. Steins Gate, Quantum Break, mm-hmm. and of course, give them the title of the movie, Monk. It's a good movie. Let's see. I believe... Primer. Yeah, Primer. There you go. Primer. It's a good movie. Mm-hmm. Go watch it. I've seen some people say that it w- that it was too techno y but if you're trying to do grounded time travel, you kind of have to be. Yeah, and we can't do the the bullshit techno babble of Roddenberry, where we have inverse tachyon pulses doing some other bullshit. Or slingshotting around the moon somehow does time travel. <laughs> slingshotting <laughs> around the sun somehow does time travel, so you can go save the hills. Superman flying backwards. <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh, gr- that's a groan right there. <laughs> or um, should I bring should I bring up the reverse Earth thing in Power Rangers Zio? Stop! Uh... Stop! <laughs> <laughs> it... Literally oh, no. channeling and... John Tron at this moment. Stop! <laughs> and also, I gotta correct you. It wasn't in Zio. It led into Zio. It was yeah. the end of season three. My apo- my apologies. Regardless, stop. <laughs> John Tron yeah. John Tron says stop. Yeah, that's a whole can of words we don't need to be opening. Mm-hmm. Now, one might a- one might ask, but um BioShock Infinite doesn't isn't really doing ti- isn't really doing time travel. So why are we bringing that kind of thing up? It is doing something adjacent with the ide- with the idea of causality. For with those this- who who don't understand what we mean by causality, it's very simple. Every cause has an effect. Well, thing A leads to thing B. This yeah. is this is causality. And, and this is more of a sense of a causality loop. Because the actions of your future self are what cause your past self to get to that point. Even the- you, could end, you could end up as your own grandfather. No, Fry, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Continue, Monk. Even though, even though the, if I'm be, if I'm being honest, when it comes to that, when it comes to that sort of causality, that sort of, par, that sort of um, potential paradox thing, the one, one particular entry that does that I think does it a bit more properly, and expo- and explores it in far more detail, is the Legacy of Kane series. Ah, Legacy of Cain. You know, that is a story we should have brought up that, that does bring up time travel and causality pretty well. Um, and that brings up multiple timelines as well. 
Much and like also, what Infinite is trying to. And it also brings up the timeline where I cry because Defiance is the last game. Uh, uh, that's this timeline for anyone who doesn't understand that. Yeah. <clears throat> we are truly on the darkest timeline. Fitting that Elden Ring should be so wholesome to me. Uh, <laughs> but the to give to give a summary when it comes to when it comes to the rules that um, Legacy of Cain has with time travel, which it adheres to very strictly, and that's the that's the key thing. When you're dealing with time travel or alternate timelines, you can't fuck around. If you if you go if um if you go back then you did go back. If you go back and change history, you didn't. Because that history was already was history. to be the way that you changed it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, the, the way that the Legacy of Cain uh, series deals with time travel is heavy determinism. It is a, it is a, uh, a, a definitely a, an act of determinism, mm -hmm. which is the idea that no matter what, things were going to happen the way they happened, and nothing you could do would stop them from happening that way. Uh, even if, if you, you do, even if you do change it, all that time will time will self correct itself. Well, that's a slightly different thing. the The implications in in Legacy of Cain were, if you go back in time and change history, well, you've just changed history to whatever the history you already know is. Mm -hmm. So the result is. Here is my history, so I'm going to go back and change history. Okay, you went back and changed history, so here your history is. It's the same thing because your actions are what caused your history to be that way in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's it we, in certain causal and time travel circles, both fiction and theoretical physics. This is called a stable time loop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it implies that your actions were always determined to be this way. And nothing would have changed that. Yeah, uh, it's a it's something I hate a lot because determinism makes me want to punch a puppy. Now, of course, the wild card in this is that th is the fact that there is one per there is one person in the entirety of that of the Legacy of Cain series who is immune to fate, that immune being, to causality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that being Raziel. He is the living wild card. Raziel lies outside of causality. He eats souls. We don't know where they go afterwards. Mm -hmm. They don't actually get put back into the wheel like like uh, the Outer God and Mobius implied. <laughs> they just go nowhere. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself is definitely anti-causal. Um, but yes. Now, that's a good way to deal with it. You have very strict rules. And one being who can break those rules as part of the way you want to tell your story and possibly break down some higher philosophical ideals about determinism and free will that we're not going to get into here. <clears throat> yeah, the the point is is that when when you're dealing with when you're dealing with these sorts of grand themes, you cannot get away with half measures. And I think that I think that's what ultimately frustrated us the most when it came to something like Bioshock Infinite. Is the fact that it wants to play with the with these philosophical concepts, but it doesn't have the skill to actually explore them. Not only that, um, it relies on the spectacle of its visual set pieces to distract you from the subpar exploration of these ideals, and in so doing, even forgets its own rules. Mm-hmm. Because again, like I said, all versions of Elizabeth drowning just one version of Booker DeWitt does not kill all versions of Booker DeWitt, meaning no Elizabeths should die. Uh, you guys know that I am a bit. You guys know that I'm a big stickler for rule consistency, both in get both uh, in game design and otherwise. Yes, we do. I'd also I'd also like to say that with the way Elizabeth is portrayed in doing things, how we see so many multiple different versions of Elizabeth. And what has happened to them? She's technically a causal. She's outside of causality due to her own actions and the actions of others manipulating her quantum powers. So even if she did somehow manage to kill all versions of Booker DeWitt at once, she wouldn't cease to exist because she's now outside of causality. Which is funny because that technically makes her a god. Huh. 
Then again, I'm not kidding. Then again, then again I, I have kind of joked about the idea that Elizabeth was someone was some author's waifu in the worst way. Yeah, she's a Mary Sue, that's for sure. Meaningless, me, meaningless maiming is a part of character development? Check. Superpowers that she just kind of stumbles into can control uh, pretty well even the first time she tries to control them and uh, everybody... Is everybody's darling? Check. Um, the powers eventually become near godlike? Check. She's a Mary Sue. Which is funny, because Booker is not a Mary Sue. <laughs> Booker's a wooby. You might need to explain what a wooby is for those uninitiated. A wooby is someone given all of the most terrible fates for the sake of them. Uh, he fu he fulfills being the pitiful thing that is mistreated because it's what suits the the uh, the narrative at the time. He's not given a character. He's just made to be something that you find pitiful. Eternal suffering. He's also because he's constantly you know kept down by whatever circumstances of fate around him. He's usually a very dour character. Of course, sometimes this leads into Wooby Destroyer of Worlds territory, where Wooby decides that he hates everything and everyone and tries to destroy the world. High syndrome. <clears throat> but uh, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in with that in mind, as far as I think this I think this is kind kind of the reason why we haven't seen why we haven't seen much regarding where System Shock or Bioshock is going to be heading down the road because of the fact that. I think they may have written themselves into a corner in the same way that Asimov read, wrote himself into a corner when it came to Foundation. No. It's actually because Irrational Games restructured into a new studio in 2017 and have had a uh, game developing since two years before that that's been stuck in development hell for seven years because Ken Levine can't make up his mind and constantly puts pressure on the employees, causing a lot of employee burnout. Yeah, there was that There was that whole expose that... Can, that revealed Ken Levine to be kind of a dickhead. He doesn't know how to manage, which is why he was only ever a creative director for the longest time. He's no good as a CEO. So you think you think that the only way something something's going to come out of irrational games is is if um is if somebody takes the CEO role and puts a leash on him? If someone takes a CEO role, puts him back where he does well, where he does what he's good at. Where he's very he's very good at doing creative stuff and being a creative director. I will not fault him for that. He's super good at it. But at actually motivating his people, not so much. Um, he, he, he just puts his mind on how their project is going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's gonna beat down anybody. Um, so Ken, if you do ever watch this one day for whatever reason. Please, 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 I beg of you, do what you're awesome at. I want to see what you're awesome at, and I don't want to see you run your developers into the fucking ground. Um, beyond all that, uh, I, what was it called now? Ghost Story Games or something like that? Or Ghost House Games? Something along those lines. But yeah, they they were defunct back in 2017. Mm -hmm. And at the and as far as as far as that System Shock remake, well, we haven't seen we we had that de we had that demo which was all right, but we haven't seen hide nor hair on that front. And um, I don't want to get into the whole Overkill and Starbreeze situation because <laughs> talk about a can of worms. <laughs> yeah, so, let's let's not and say we did. Yeah. But I'd say I'd say that more or less more or less covers that covers everything regarding um but regarding the trials and tribulations of BioShock. Next week we'll ha we'll certainly have something different and tomorrow we'll ha we'll have the ret we'll have the return of something a little familiar. So stay t so stay tuned for that. And plus, I've got plus I've got a few other a few other surprises to 
come down the road as, th as things go in. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.